This is Tech Talk Born episode 304. Cloudy with a chance of zombies. Eh? Welcome to Tech Talk with Buona. This technology podcast covers tech news and reviews for the entire week. And now here's your host, me, Buona McCall. Greetings, folks, and welcome to episode 304 of Tech Talk with Buona. We got a great show lined up for you. Got about four stories to talk about in the tech gaming industry tech talk with one is produced every sunday you can also check out my other podcast at game chat with buona which is produced every wednesday but this past wednesday we didn't produce game chat with buona because i was feeling under the weather and um, i'm still kind of recovering from that uh so i apologize if i cough on stream or whatever you know you guys know what i'm talking about if you've been watching my podcast over the years i'm always dealing with allergies and or something well not always but you know, I'm dealing with things and stuff like that. There, we got a great show lined up for you. Also, check out my podcast on Anchor.fm. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be putting some stuff up there soon. I keep saying that. It's been I've been saying soon for two weeks now. It'll happen. It'll happen. Got a great show. Let's get to it. And for our first story, we're gonna talk about Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha is 10 years old. Man, it seems like just yesterday. This web browser came up on the scene with a unique approach of science and math-based queries. It was kind of weird at the time, and uh, I think a lot of us, when we first saw it come out, we were using it as experiments, like, hey, you stupid browser, what's 2 plus 2? And then Wolfram Alpha was give, will give us like the meaning of life in addition to 2 plus 2 possibly equaling 5. It's a great video over on Slashdot. This is where I found the article. This is just throwback central today. Slashdot.org. It, it still exists. This is a website that still exists. And they have a throwback video of the guy when he first hit the switch to launch it. And he was explaining what was going on. He's like, I'm going to press this button and a and bunch of, a, our, of our data centers and our clusters that we have are going to spin up. And you're going to see all these graphs light up and hopefully it'll go well. And then all of a sudden they hit the button and all these queries started going through. I haven't been to Wolfram Alpha dot, Wolfram Alpha dot com in a while, but I do use their stuff via API. We use it in our Discord for, for queries. And one of the things that I notice quite often is that Wolfram Alpha, it gives you too much information. It's, it's TMI, the website, because you get all kinds of, it's like, Wolfram Alpha, how many days until August? Well, there are 64 lunar cycles, and then Jupiter will go across the moon 48 times, and, 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 and several thousand of, of, of red ants will build their quarters 17 billion times. It's just like all these different correlations to different data. It's, it's fascinating. And the cool thing is that it's independent, private, and still free of external advertising, according to the article over on slash talk slash dot dot org. Here's a quote. It says, it was unique and surprising achievement when it first arrived over its first decade, and it's become even stronger and more unique. It's found its way into more and more of the fabric of the computational world, both realizing some of the long-term aspirations of artificial intelligence and defining new directions for what one can expect to be possible. Oh, and by now, a significant fraction of a billion of people have used it. And we've been able to keep it private and independent. And its main website has stayed free and without external advertising. As years have gone by, Wolfram Alpha has found its way into intelligent assistants like Siri and now, it's all, and now also Alexa. It's also become part of chatbots, to tutoring systems, and smart TVs. NASA websites, smart OCR apps, talking toy dinosaurs, that I didn't know, smart contract oracles, and more. It's been used by an immense range of people for all sorts of purposes. Inventors have used it to figure out what might be possible. Leaders and policymakers have used it to make decisions. Professionals have used it to do their jobs every day. People around the world have used it to satisfy the curiosity about all, all sorts of peculiar things. And countless students have used it to solve problems and learn. Man, 10 years ago, Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha. 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 Wolfram Alpha. 10 years old. Check it out, guys. Over on Slashdot.org. They got the details. Turning 10 years old and still going strong. 
And for our next story, we're going to talk about Microsoft and Sony. And it's going to be kind of a gaming story. But since I didn't have Game Chat 1, I wanted to talk about this now. Microsoft and Sony have formed a cloud gaming and AI partnership, according to this article, over on The Verge. Dot com and they have a little subheadline calling it a, an unusual partnership. But if you read the article like I have, and you'll probably do that, right? You're going to read it. You're going to read it. You'll see that it does kind of make sense from a business perspective. Microsoft and Sony are announcing a partnership. The two companies will explore joint development of future cloud solutions in Microsoft Azure to support their respective game and content streaming services. This is what Microsoft said in a statement. They said these efforts will also continue, these efforts will also including building better development platforms for the content creator community. That one made me raise an eyebrow. I'm like, what are they gonna do for me? Huh. They said they will share additional information where it's possible. So until then, I was like, all right. I, I mean, I was reading it, I was like, man, what, what, what's going on? Because these guys have been rivals for years. But then it says Google. And I'm like, oh, that's right. Google released Stadia. We talked about that a few shows ago. Or they announced Stadia. The article says it also means Google, a new rival, a new gaming rival to Microsoft and Sony, will miss out on hosting on Sony's cloud services. Google unveiled a Stadia game streaming service earlier this year. And the company will use YouTube to push it to the masses. Stadia is a threat to both Microsoft and Sony, and it looks like the companies are teaming up. So Sony has some underlying infrastructure assistance to fight back. Stadia is going to be on Chrome browser, Chromecast, and Pixel devices. Sony already has a cloud gaming platform. You guys know that. If you don't, they do. And Microsoft says they're going to be doing their own xCloud gaming services. So Sony and Microsoft are joining forces to fight the behemoth known as Google in their Stadia platform. Uh, Stadia promises to, to change online gaming and that's Microsoft and Sony's arena and Google's a new player. So if you are a CEO or if you anybody in, so, in, in, in the business world and Google enters your space, it's time to have an emergency meeting. It's time to, to have an offsite. You know, let, let's let's go to the Rockies. Let's go. Let's have a ski resort. They have a shut in. You know how they do that. They they, when there's an emergency, they spend a lot of money. Let's let's go to offsite on the moon and let's discuss what we're going to do to combat this new this new threat known as Google. It's going to be interesting to see how far Sony and Microsoft go to uh, to do this and how far they're going to go in sharing information and how much of the bad blood they've had over the years. I wouldn't call it bad blood. It's just fierce competition, fierce competition between them. In the console arena, um, but when it comes to Windows and when it comes to other Microsoft products, I don't think Microsoft and Sony have that that much of a divergent philosophy. I think I think both companies have very similar philosophies, and um, you know they, they you know they did they differ in the consoles, but I think in this world of cloud, they they they're smart enough to come together and agree. Um, but I don't know how long that's going to last. And I don't know how much the Google threat is going to even even justify this because I don't really see Google Stadia taking off as much as people think it will. Um, I think when it was first announced, people were saying that everything's going to change. This is a game breaker, pun intended. This is a game breaker, um, game changer. But cloud gaming is forever going to have issues because a lot of the a lot of the problems are independent of the provider. It's all about the network. And Google has no control over the network. So that's a core single point of failure right there. Well, multiple points of failure. If you think about how crazy networking can get and how and how different companies have to deal with it from a support and just infrastructure perspective, you know, how are you going to deal with bad connections? Like all the time, it's going to when you're talking about low latency over the Internet connections. The, the smallest packet loss could cause your, your character to die in a video game. And that's when we rage quit and throw our controllers into the, into the wall. <laughs> right? When inputs lag, when it's not your machine, you know, because you're, you're, you're doing cloud gaming, 
and you have lag inputs or, you know, you have a, a lag spike and then you wake up dead in a competitive game or something like that. Even a single player game. You're in a hard part of the single player campaign and you get to a part where you have to do some 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 skillful movements and all of a sudden your inputs are lagging because I don't know, some random node on the network decided to drop. So we'll see how Stadia stands up. We'll see how Azure stands up too with Microsoft's cloud platform. Um, I think they still are kind of in the niche category where, oh, that's nice to have. Here's a side thing. But I don't think that cloud gaming is ready to take the forefront until those networking infrastructure issues are addressed. Because especially in the U.S., especially in the U.S., it is very, very sparse and it's not going to really take off for the mass market. It is a good niche thing. And I think it is the future of gaming, but our internet and our network network infrastructure has to catch up. Check it out, guys. Over on TheVerge.com, Sony and Microsoft joining forces for the Azure Cloud solution, possibly to fight the Google Stadia juggernaut that's forming. And for our next story, Google. Google's using Gmail to track a history of the things you buy. Did you know that? Over on CNBC.com. I'm not surprised. This article uh, was posted in a bunch of different places, but this was the first one that crossed my radar. I think The Verge had it. Some other people had it. And there is this new, well, it's not necessarily a new thing, but there's a page that Google has, which actually shows your purchase history based on the emails you got in your Gmail. Um, And it goes way back. If you've been using Gmail a long time, I looked at mine. If you go to myaccount.google.com slash purchases, that's the URL. It goes pretty far back and it's, I, the more I scrolled, the more I was like, oh, OK, I, I didn't know this. This was a thing, you know, um, it, it shows a surprisingly accurate list, as this article points out. And I I think I, I, I was surprised. too. I was like, man, I forgot I bought that. It's like going way back to 2012. Um, and some of them were inaccurate. Like I know there were some things on there. I was like, no, I didn't buy that. I think it was probably either a spam message I got through or some kind of a, I don't know, offer that it misinterpreted, but it wasn't completely accurate. But if you go and check out that page, you can see all the things that you, that you bought. Now, Google says that you can easily delete it, but I think that's kind of misleading because as, as this article points out, You have to go back and individually delete the emails that have the messages in them. If you go to the purchases interface, they have an interface there where you can delete it, but it's one at a time. I don't see anything in here to remove them all. Like if you just want to wipe it out, um, there's nothing to delete all. You can't opt out of this. I think there was an option option mentioned in here. Uh, Yeah, I think they said that there's an activity and activities controls. You can turn it off, but you don't have any ability to to delete it all. Google says it doesn't use your Gmail to show you ads and it promises it does not sell your personal information, which include your Gmail and Google account information and does not share your personal information with advertisers unless you have asked us to. So you can rest assured that Google has your back. Wink. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I think Google is in the advertisement business. That's what I think. So I don't think they're evil. I think they're in the advertisement business. I think they just, they, that's how they make their money. And your data is a very, very potent fuel. Your data is a very, very potent, I don't know, catalyst for making some serious money. There's a lot of money to be made with user data these days in conjunction with advertisements. So, I, 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 like I said, they're an advertisement company. So if you buy a phone from Google, if you use a Google product, just know that they're in the advertisement business. They may not be, you know, it's a lot of people said that you're selling yourself to Google, which you kind of are. And Google is trying to, trying to get better on privacy. I'll give them that they're, they're, they're making, they're taking steps in the right direction. But at the end of the day, a lot of what they do is to sell ads and your data feels that it's very, very strong. Um, so check this article out, guys. There's a lot, a lot of uh, concern around this because this purchases page, I don't even know how long it's been here. I think it's, people just started to find it. Uh, I'd have to check the article on that to be sure. But it, it's kind of, to me, I wish there was a way to just delete all, like delete all of these purchases, 
and just get rid of them so I don't have to worry about it in the future. But there isn't. It's, it seems to be a one at a time thing. And I think that's the biggest problem with it so far. I don't necessarily mind the purchases because, like I said, they're an ad company. I kind of assume that they're taking this data and using it anyway for something, which is part of the reason why I don't use Gmail anymore. Um, but I have used Gmail for many, many years, and a lot of my data is in there. Uh, but I didn't know that they were they were tracking purchases. Now let's be let's be clear: purchases. If you talk to any advertiser out there and you could promise them, or you could tell them that I have this user's purchase history, they will salivate until they need a bib, because that gives them so much information on how to market towards you. You've bought a coffee maker in the past. Oh my God, I'm going to toss 6 billion coffee maker ads in your face. Um, you bought some, some pet products. All of a sudden you're going to see pet ads everywhere. So they, 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 they grovel at the mouth of all oh, you, all oh, you have previous purchase history. You know, that's how Amazon, you know, if you buy something from Amazon, that's how they get you, you know, but it's, it, sometimes I'm not gonna say all the time. Sometimes they, they use that information to show you future Amazon suggestions and results. And sometimes it's contained within Amazon, but it, sometimes it follows you around the net. That's that, that digital footprint that we've been trying to get rid of that. Don't track me, bro. We talked about that in that podcast with, um, with duck, duck goes campaign to introduce a new law to prevent to, to, for do not track to actually do not track. That's what that law is proposals all about because you can put do not you can turn on do not track option in your browser but websites don't have to honor it they can just say that's 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 nice i'm going to track you anyway um and that's the current directive but this law says that if you have that turned on that companies would have to disable tracking or be faced with the consequences that's what that, that go wants to get, go for so this is that road that this article is kind of kind of moving towards and, and pointing towards is you know, if you got a page, a public page that shows all of your purchases, you just think about what you can't see, what type of data correlations and database queries are happening behind the scenes on all the data in your email. Google says they don't do it, though. But Google says they don't do a lot of stuff. Like they don't track you when you turn off when you, when you turn off location tracking. They say they don't track. They don't track you. But we found out many, many times that they still track you. Even when you turn off location tracking, you're still being tracked. So they'll, they'll say they don't do stuff, but they've, they've been caught doing it anyway. So, <laughs> so you got to be careful when you use Google products. Just know that's, that's the moral of this story, chat. People of the world, and podcast listeners, and llamas and frogs, is that this is an advertisement company that you're giving your data to. So they're going to use it in some form or fashion to make money off of ads. Check it out, guys. Over on CNBC.com, they get the details. Google Gmail tracks the history of the things you buy, and it's kind of cumbersome to delete. And for our final story, we're going to talk about zombie load. Oh, my gosh. It's back. Intel chips, man. I'm an Intel boy, and every time I turn around for the past couple of years, there is some major security flaw. <laughs> oh, man. This was called zombie load, right? And... Big Tech, according to TechCrunch.com, is stepping in to patch this newly disclosed security flaw affecting almost every Intel chip since 2011. And uh, yeah, it's it's bad. There's there's no other way to say it. It's bad. Uh, it's called zombie load or micro architectural micro architectural data sampling (MDS). As its technical name, which can leak sensitive data stored in the processor, such as passwords, secret keys, and account tokens and private messages. You know all that stuff that you you, you kind of don't want to get out there. Yeah. Um, but the good news is that according to this article, a bunch of major manufacturers of hardware and software are patching their products to protect you as much as they can against zombie load. First up is Apple. They put out a fix. Um uh, let's see. Let's say the tech giant said in an advisory that any system running macOS Mojave 10.45 released Monday is patched. So the Monday patch got you covered over there. This will prevent an attack from being run through Safari and other apps. And it says most users won't most users won't experience any decline in performance, but some people can face up to a 40 percent performance hit if they opt into a full set of mitigations. 
and that's the thing with this this whole this whole zombie load stuff is that the fix causes extra performance on your processors depending on how much you're trying to do so the software solutions are not ideal um and that is it's very similar to the previous <laughs> the previous oh man i'm just having flashbacks google patches at android and will update chrome so a vast majority of android devices aren't affected but intel only devices will need to be patched once device makers make updates available chrome os devices such as chromebooks are already protected in the latest version and permanent mitigations will be pushed to devices in the next version um mozilla plans a long-term firefox fix they've applied mitigation recommended by apple on mac os and the mac os limitation will be part of their upcoming firefox release release 67 and extended support release update 60.7 both scheduled for may 21st which is next tuesday yes and firefox beta and nightly are already included in the change microsoft has rolled out some windows updates i think this is going to be the one that you guys want to pay attention to the most um in a tech Night article the company said that uh, customers may need to obtain directly from the device maker microcode updates for their processor microsoft is pushing many of the microcode updates through windows itself through windows update but there's also um, but they are also available from its website and the software will be released Tuesday, which is also May 21st through windows update on patch on a patch Tuesday. I'm not gonna say patch Tuesday, uh, Microsoft Azure customers are already protected. And finally, Amazon patches AWS. So AWS is being, uh, addressed. It has designed and implemented its infrastructure with protections against these types of bugs and has also deployed additional protections for MDS. All EC2 host infrastructure has been updated with these new protections and no customer actions required at the infrastructure level. I also got an email from, from DigitalOcean and there's some other people out there that are implementing patches and mitigations as well. So it is, it is patch time. It is time for you to, to look up if your chip has been affected uh, number one, there's a bunch of sites out there that will test your chip. Uh, and I believe that it affects um, everything prior to the Generation 8, I think, will be affected. I think the Generation 8 and Generation 9 are already protected, but the older processors, uh, I have to double check on that. But I believe that's the case. At any rate, no matter what processor you have, go check and see if you're affected. Because this is a big, 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 big problem. I mean, this is hardware security flaw and Linux, Mac OS, every, phones, everything's got to get updated. Otherwise, you're going to be open to some really serious stuff that's going to be hitting very, very soon. Check it out, guys. Over on TechCrunch.com, they got the details. Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla have released patches for the zombie load chip flaws, but there's going to be more updates coming in the future. So keep your eye out and over there. And that concludes episode 304 of Tech Talk with Borna. I want to thank you all for listening to the show. Please follow this podcast and my other one, Game Chat with Borna, over at Buona.tv slash podcast. You can subscribe over there on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and all that kind of good stuff. I also have another podcast on Anchor.fm called B-Rants, B-Rants, where I just rant about various things. And I'm on episode three or four on that. So that's, that's kicked off very nicely also follow my youtube at youtube.com slash buona where i cross post these podcasts in an audio only format with thumbnail so if you prefer to use youtube as your as your platform of choice for ingesting podcasts i am available over there on youtube it.com twitter.com slash buona instagram.com slash buona and finally check me out at buona.live aka twitch.tv slash buona where i have my live stream where i stream practically every day i'm actually streaming right now on my quote unquote day off from streaming. Um, and I stream every day starting from 3 p.m. Eastern onward. So you can check me out over there. Like I said, look for new podcasts on anchor.fm. I'm gonna be producing. I still gotta do my episode on on, on the Avengers. I wanna give a B rant episode on the Avengers. I'm giving people more time to watch it because it's it's gonna be it's gonna be spoiler heavy. So I don't want people to get upset even though you put spoiler tags on stuff people are they find a way to get spoiled and with podcasts it's kind of easy to get spoiled because some people just have podcatchers where they just play episodes back to back to back they don't look at the titles they don't look at the show notes they just listen so with podcasts you got to be extra careful 
to to introduce spoiler content you can make a lot of people upset and unsubscribe we don't want that we're trying to grow this grow in this grow back to where we were in this space and get some sponsorships and stuff like that so we gotta keep we gotta keep everybody we can man we gotta figure out how to keep them all all right that concludes this episode i'll see you guys next week same time same station we produce this podcast every sunday game chat wanna on wednesday you guys have a great day i'll see you next time have a good one